anybody know what day it is? 150. 150 days away from BYU versus Southern Illinois. Uh, we didn't play the music, but I'll just sing. That's all good. Uh, BYU de defense coordinator Jay Hill was asked on Saturday at the uh, close of spring ball uh, about the defensive line after spring practices, and he had something very interesting to say. Here it is. The one thing right now with the way the recruiting went last year, we feel some of our best players are still joining us, and it's going to create a lot more competition. Um, but if you're recruiting the right, right way, that's how it's always going to be. There's always going to be competition coming in. It's the starter's job to hold on to their job and play great, and it's the backup's job to beat them out. So we're, we're looking forward to some increased competition with those guys coming in. Okay, then. Some of the best guys that we have are still coming in. So what do you make of those comments? Well, I it's an optimistic comment, and when we heard it, we were like, uh, well, who's he talking about? Uh, the portal opens up uh, in the middle of the month. Uh, is it portal finds? Do they, have, do they know guys who, who are coming? Um, and, uh, and then also who they've signed that aren't here yet because they had to finish school before they could get here. And so we put a list of some of those names together. There's a lot of Polynesian flavor in the incoming guys. Um, but I think it gives you a shot of adrenaline because we talked the other day about the position groups and where they were and, and the defensive line was certainly a priority and, uh, and reinforcements are coming. And here's some of them. Yeah, let's walk through them. So these are guys that aren't going on a mission first. Who will be here in the fall? Fall camp on the D-line, Luke To'o Malatai, Sani Tuala, linebacker Sefo Akuila, Naki Tuakoi, cornerback Jonathan Kabea, and safeties uh, Matthias Leach and Falatau Satuala. Satuala was a huge get. He was at the yeah. Under, All, Under uh, Armour All-American uh, game. He announced publicly there. So are these guys going to have a huge impact on this next season? Typically freshmen, there are just like one or two that really do make a massive impact. But maybe these guys are so good, a few of them break the two deep and are in the mix as some backups or who knows. But I wouldn't think that any of these guys would start right away that we just listed. But maybe they press for backup time and there's injuries and yeah. different moments where you need them. But that's exciting from Jay Hill to say, you know what? Hey, some of our best guys aren't here yet. Yeah, they're coming in. Using the word best is the one that jumps off the page to me because yeah. if they're some of their best guys, then maybe they will show up in, on August 31st. Yeah. Uh, whether they start or at least they push the starter uh, like he hasn't been pushed before going, hey, wait a second, I'm, I'm going to be out. Uh, and, and that answers a lot of the depth questions we were talking about the other day too. Is, um, it's not about the starters, it's about when the starters get hurt, who are the guys coming in? And we saw over the course of that Big 12 season that you had to have more depth. Uh, because when the starters went down, when Bywater went down, when Nelson went down, when the safeties went down, when Keaton Slovis went down, when Aiden Robbins was out with a broken rib and all that yeah. stuff, it's, it's who are the next guys, and it sounds like that was the big address in the recruiting class. So I like to hear him throw out the word best. Some of our best players are going to join us in the summer. And are they the best right away? Typically it no. takes uh, you know, a season or two uh, for guys to develop and get into a position where they're making a lot of plays. It's not often that a, a true freshman comes in and has a massive right. impact in college football. It takes a minute at most programs, let alone BYU. So I'm excited especially about those two linebackers, by the way. Sefo Akuila, Naki Tuakoi. Those guys are very close and very talented. Um, in fact, I think they live together uh, for Over a little while, area. right? In yeah. the Bay Area, yeah. So I'm, I'm excited about them. So let's, let's see what happens in the fall because certainly you need to add talent, add depth, and BYU felt like in this recruiting class in February, mostly in December, that they added some real quality. That quality hopefully shows up soon, but sometimes it's, okay, we look back two or three years back and go, oh, that guy is now making an impact. So I, I think there are guys that kind of have waited their time and they'll start to make an impact this year, and then these guys will sort of cover behind them uh, right after that. And in addition to these guys, we, we, there's that transfer portal, and, and BYU is now in the business of putting guys in the NFL, whether they're offensive linemen, whether they're linebackers, whether they're receivers, whether they're quarterbacks, hey, whether they're running backs, um, or punt returners, you know, it's a little bit of everything. And, and so now that, that's, now that you're in the business there, you have an opportunity. If you need a couple of linemen who want to go to the NFL that think they're good enough, and maybe they're not getting the minutes where they were, uh, they can look and see what, what BYU's done with linemen, and they're looking for linemen. So I think those opportunities, too, in, in, in addition to the, the names we've shown you, um, it's going to be a very interesting 
rest of this month, and then all, su all summer, all of a sudden. I would love for BYU to be in the D-lineman game. The, uh, the BYU has not been in that space as much as I was hoping, I think, when right. Kalani Stake came here uh, in 2016. Kairos Tonga is kind of the one guy in the NFL from yeah. BYU. I would, I would love to have more. Uh, O-line, BYU's producing left tackles and quarterbacks at a high rate. But D-line at Utah... You look up there and you go, oh, man, that's a D-line factory. And that's what we were hoping that, uh, you know, Kalani and Elias Tuiaki would create here. Still figuring that out. Maybe Tyler Batty is the next iteration of that guy. Does Isaiah Banya get a shot next year? We'll see. Uh, but uh, hopefully the next couple of years with the influx of talent and Jay Hill's great recruiting around this state, uh, the BYU can produce a couple of those guys. Because if you produce great D-linemen, that means your defense was pretty good. Yeah. Um, it's rare to have a great defensive line and just a stinky defense. BYU hopefully will get in that game, and then now we're talking about a couple more wins than just make a bowl game. And every recruiting guru we've talked to has said that BYU's trending that way. They're trending towards yeah. um, where they want to be in all those positions as opposed to trending away from, and, and there's another positive. And I think that's why... Every time we, we hear from Jay Hill, and he sat in and called the first half of the alumni game with mm -hmm. us, uh, with Jay with an open mic, which was a lot of fun, <laughs> there's so much optimism oozing out of him yeah. after one year, really. Um, and, and the sky's the limit on, on what he thinks BYU can do. And, and he's a catalyst, obviously, with that. And, of course, the other assistants and Kalani as the head coach. But, but, uh, but, but here's a guy who came in and looked around and said, we've got to get bigger faster, stronger, and we have to do it right away. So here was where we are after one year recruiting class with, with his influence, and then, and then all the trends point, point, point to positive. So why not? I mean, it's an optimistic thing that, yeah. that we sit here today, and, and again, when he throws out the word, hey, our best, some of our best guys, they're, yeah, near you. they're, not, they're coming. Let's go. <laughs> and you got, you got to look at this staff and feel really encouraged by what you have with not only the the group that you're bringing back from last year, but getting Sione Puha, who did great work up at Utah, getting Gary Anderson here, yeah. who was a tremendous coach uh, at, at obviously Utah, Utah State, Oregon State, and so on, Wisconsin, and so on and so forth. The, Gary Anderson in the mix as an analyst, just providing some uh, experience and uh, wisdom in, in those rooms, is not to mention the head coach, Kalani Taki, who was an amazing DC himself. Um, that is a pretty talented group of guys and can BYU get to a space where we're not just talking about going to a bowl game, but, hey, challenging for a Big 12 title, yeah. which, which would be awesome in the future. We're hoping, you know, in the next five, eight years that that's the case. And if you're challenging, maybe sooner, if you're challenging for that, you're challenging for the 14-team playoff. Now you're, yes. You know, now you're in there. Now I'm like, wait, is it 12, 14, what year is it? It's what? 12, yeah, and it's then 12, it's going up. It's 12 this year, and, and then... Someday it might go I to a 70-team playoff, <laughs> which leads us to topic yes, two. Yes, it does. So there was an article in The Athletic yesterday which got us all thinking. It details there's a group of folks um, who are considering a super league. What they're proposing is a mm. college football super league. Get rid of the conferences uh, as we know them. Determine playoff berths solely on the field. Use promotion and relegation for smaller schools. Pay players directly and manage NIL and the transfer portal. So it says semi-pro, it screams semi-pro all over. It is already. Um, the league would include 70 schools, all of them that are currently in the P5, and that's BYU, and, hey. uh, and then Notre Dame and, and, and some of the other schools. And then universities would own a percentage of the league, so they'd be invested. Uh, the bigger brands would get the bigger share, that, that happens today. Um, that wouldn't be any different. Uh, and so this is the pitch uh, that this group's talking about for down the road. They're still locked in the contracts at least through 26, right, with the playoff and, and all that stuff. Right, but and the other TV deals are in the early 2030s. 2030s, that's right. So would you favor something like this moving forward, or you just want to try to keep it the way it is? It is interesting because the uh, dissolution of conferences would be interesting. There's a certain identity associated with being in a conference that I'm not sure, like, the SEC and Big Ten are willing to sort of give up at this point. Not, this isn't getting a lot of traction. It's just uh, a proposal, so we're discussing it. Um, they would go to uh, seven, what was it, seven divisions of ten, and then yeah. auto bids. 
and an uh, eighth division for the for the, for other the almost ten of everybody yeah. else, aka the Boise State, the, the non-power fours, yeah. right? Because um, we're at power four now. We say P5, but yeah, there's no Pac-12 going in next year. It is interesting. I'm not sure I love it. I'm not sure I hate it. Um, I I don't know. I, what do the TV contracts look like? What what does it look like for BYU in terms of revenue? Uh, so I, I have more questions I would need to ask and figure out. But the idea that's interesting, the Super League phrase, though, is based off what soccer happened in Europe, there was going to be, oh, we're going to pick all the best teams. You never get relegated, and you're in this league, and now we're seeing all the best matchups. And they got hammered for that. And quickly, like two days later, they were like, oh, we're not doing this, <laughs> after they kind of announced that they were going to. So the fact that the Super League is used, real negative connotation there. So um, I, I have some questions. I'm not in love. I don't, I don't hate it. What do you think? Yeah, I, I can see them using the NFL model, you know, with their divisions of the, the NFC Straight West. Straight records, Central, no whatever. committee, they said. It would keep BYU and Utah together. Florida State likes this, probably. It would be a regional thing. Yeah, Florida, Florida <laughs> State does. Clemson's probably in on it, too. Yeah. Um, here's the thing. We're in a place where we never really thought it would go because we never really thought about it, right? Mm -hmm. We never thought players would get paid to play college football, and here they are. So... Um, when when the Jetsons uh, when the Jetsons were, cartoon was on TV years yep. ago, it was like, yeah, that's not going to happen. Now it all happens except for us floating in space, and I think that's just Still around working the corner. On that one. Yeah. Um, so so here we go, and it's going to go somewhere, right? It's just not going to stay where it is. Yes. And if you are outside of the Big Ten and the SEC as a Power Five program. Maybe you want, maybe your security is in this mm. as opposed to that group just going, we're doing our thing and we're out. Which and excluding they, which they the could Big do. 12. And excluding the Big 12. And ACC. ACC. So if you're, if you're a P5 school, you're in. That's, there's some comfort in that. Uh, and BYU knows everything, how it feels to be out. Yep. Um, and so there's not a, well, would that exclude BYU, would it not? But, um, but it might keep... Uh, the upper half of the SEC and the upper half of the Big Ten, which is the only part of the conferences anyone cares about, because the lower tier teams, uh, Van the Vanderbilts of the world, don't matter in this in this argument. They're just along for the ride. Um, I think the rest of us get to go along for the ride if that's if that's the the mold. But it's going somewhere, uh, and it's not going backwards. And so here's a forward thinking idea that actually can can't you see it actually happening as opposed to yes. no way. Yeah, I, okay, rewind to 10 years ago. Did we think that what has happened would happen, right? It's 2014, and some of the shakeups have happened. We could not have imagined that the Pac-12 was going to go away or that we'd be in not just a 14 but a 12 and then 14 team playoff. Even two years ago, we would never thought USC would join the Big Ten. Right? That, that was crazy. Uh, SMU and Stanford and Cal are in the ACC. <laughs> like, what are we talking about? What the next 10, 20, 50 years look like in, in college sports looks totally crazy. I do have questions about this as it pertains to all the other sports associated with schools. Is, I, I would assume that it's just, is it just football in this Super League, right? And then the NCAA continues to run the other sports? Because, uh, of course, a lot of these teams at schools depend on football yeah. for the revenue. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily want that to be affected uh, in that way, because obviously here we love the Olympic sports. We love what we do with men's uh, volleyball and women's we soccer love the big and softball. Dance. And so on. Yes, the big dance is a big deal. Like that's still going to always exist. But I would hate for suddenly, if something like this actually happened, that at some point it's like, well, now you don't have tennis, swimming. You can't support extramurals like rugby and men's soccer and so on and so forth. I don't want those to be affected in a negative way. If anything, if it's positive in any Way great. Like if football left suddenly, w would that affect any kind of Title IX ramifications? Because I would love at some point for BYU to add certain sports. Maybe bring wrestling on back. On scholarship. Yeah. Or, uh, men's or, gymnastics or and wrestling, yeah. right? Men's, uh, women's lacrosse and so on and so forth. So I'd be interested to see what like trickle-down effect there could be in this. But uh, be, as long as BYU is included, I think that's how we generally <laughs> feel, uh, which we'll dive into in our question of the day. But the, the feeling of, okay, BYU's in a power, it's going to take a long time for us to get used to this, but power four. <laughs> BYU's in a power four conference. That, that is uh, the most validating moment in BYU sports history of, okay, hey, we belong in. Now it's time to compete at that level. So our question of the day is this. Would you be in favor of a future college football super league that breaks away from the NCAA, assuming 
BYU is included. Alex, speech on X. So he said, the only way I'd be okay with a Super League is if it included a European-style promotional relegation system. Yeah. This along with stricter financial rules, which would allow some parity within a sport. I think you'd, you'd have to have a national commissioner. Like the NFL, you'd have Somebody to have... Somebody is in charge. You'd have a to have person. an office. Yes. And, and, and all the teams would have to obey the rules or they'd be punished. Um, kind of like how the NFL runs. Uh, I, I think that's the only way that would keep the 70th team and the number one team in the same room uh, is if, if there's some some control here, do, some rules and regulations. Yes, do the SEC, we need more of those from the, well, wait. Um, the, <laughs> SEC, the SEC and Big Ten, would they actually be in favor of this? Because they have so much power and influence and money now, and they, wouldn't, they don't have to share it with the Big 12 and the ACC. Seems like, why would they, according to the article, they've, had meetings scheduled and then canceled, like didn't want to upset ESPN and Fox in this, yeah. who, by the way, are the real power brokers. Right. The SEC and Big Ten, but really it's ESPN and Fox who sort of work with them. You know what I mean? in there. Yeah, throw them in there. They're part of that thing, too, with the Big Ten moving forward. Yeah, yes, and they lost the SEC contract, which yeah. is interesting. Um, but, yeah, it's it's interesting. Who Who's in charge and who's making calling the shots? So Waffle House Rugby Football Club on X. They, they hit me up about rugby at <laughs> No, literally the only change uh, CFB needed was an 18 playoff where conference champs automatically qualify. A Super League runs the risk of becoming too centrally controlled and sterile in the name of money. Mm. Interesting. Well, with the rivalries of college football, we, we seem to be okay with the NIL stuff and the irregularities there, but when Ohio State and Michigan are playing, or BYU and Utah are playing, or the, the game is still... Um, the, the magic is still in the game. Yes. BYU was playing Oklahoma State the other day in softball. Okay, Oklahoma State's now ranked number two in the country. They're in a different place than BYU. But once they started playing, uh, I think Oklahoma State won the game we called four to three. It was a game the whole way, and therein lies the entertainment mm -hmm. and why we watch. So I don't know if this in the boardroom takes away from what you and I will sit at the 50-yard line and watch. As long as those, uh, yes, those traditions and those rivalries are maintained, yeah. which some of the last, like, 15 years neutered some of that. Right. Um, you know, you think about BYU and Utah separation, you think about Texas A&M and Texas and whatnot. As long as you can sort of maintain some of those, some of that's going to be disrupted naturally. Like, who's in what division and why? And, oh, now the auto bid. Well, there were four great teams in this one, but there was only one good team in the other. Like, that's not fair. That's what pro sports looks like, though. Some years, uh, the NL Central stinks, yeah. and that uh, champ gets out into the AL, uh, one year, NLDS. One year, the Cubs rise up. <laughs> yes, they did. Yes, they did. 